So Enclosure offers a way to analyze, as in Israel-Palestine, which is what I'll be talking about today, uh, the intertwining of colonialism, of settler colonialism, of capital accumulation, regimes of surveillance, and technologies of control. But I think there's a few um, historical specificities and processes that are important to reiterate, which, which the term enclosure kind of immediately conjures up. One is that the British land movements and the Acts of Parliament and the early 1700s to seize and transform land into private property is what we've historically kind of come to define as the land enclosure movement. And this enlargement and consolidation of land holdings, which were, you know, marked this really important transition from feudalism to capitalism. And as importantly, these overlapping forms of violence, of exploitation, of seizing assets and removal from the land, um, and the sort of general transformation into private lands were really core practices of colonialism and of settler colonialism more explicitly. And very often these transformations were endeavors that required changes <clears throat> in the law. And equally, they were achieved through various technologies, architectures, representational or visual devices such as maps, atlases, plans, walls, fences, hedges, uh, barriers, and all forms of other kinds of containment. So today, though, when we speak of enclosure, more often than not, we're referring to digital technologies where private ownership, commercially driven or profit incentivized spaces have largely displaced publicly held ones. So access, infrastructure, vir infrastructure sorry, virtual spaces, as well as our means of interaction, transaction, communication and expression are enclosed. They're commodified, they're made for profit, they're surveyed. Some of this is very physical, as in the cables, the wires, uh, the hardware, the credit cards, the parking lot sensors, the smart rooms, the RFID-enabled passports, and all sorts of other examples. Some of this is also more ephemeral, such as in the control of the electromagnetic spectrum, broadcasting rights, cloud computing, uh, Wi-Fi networks, GPS mapping, and so on. And many of these mechanisms of enclosure um, also increasingly exist on the level of data and information where specific individuals and more often companies own, operate, and claim ownership over the information and data and the new forms of value that are generated by us, the users. So things like the custom targeted ads that track our location, the clicks and the cookies that we create, uh, which or that we create, which then create valuable marketing data. Our search engine inquiries, our Gmail uh, inquiries, which help create powerful algorithms. Our TikTok scrolls, our Instagram and Facebook likes, our Amazon purchases, just about everything that we can imagine doing, the list is kind of endless. So I can kind of perhaps flip this around to say that certain logics, materialities, and technologies enter into the constitution of enclosure. So digital or high-tech enclosure nowadays tends to refer to the recentralization, consolidation, and subsequent commodification and control over the content that we create, that we share, that we upload, and also over our habits and behaviors that are then turned into valuable data, which are then mined, extracted, and sold. At the same time, uh, we're also kind of confronted with less and less physical and virtual spaces that are public and or free. So we have to pay, we have to subscribe, we have to log in, we have to accept ads, we have to accept surveillance, we have to basically fork over our data. Nowhere, arguably though, are these different forces and practices of enclosure as intertwined, as forceful, as exploitative, as alienating, and as profitable as they are in Israel-Palestine. And this is where we see various different forms of enclosure kind of come together at once colonial land expropriation, territorial dispossession, walls and checkpoints, smart weapons, security devices, drones, old and new forms of surveillance, digital controls, algorithms, the list goes on, and I will kind of uh, elaborate on this. Um, in terms of land enclosure, Israel continues to expropriate land, not simply public land or that which is cultivated by indigenous peoples, but even privately held uh, land by Palestinians. And this is often done through military force and the law, as we've witnessed, for example, this past summer in the expropriation of families across East Jerusalem. So Israel's colonial, Israel's colonial strategy 
uh, involves concentrating Palestinian populations into enclaves, confiscating land, demolishing houses, building settlements, building Jewish-only roads, even building Jewish-only cell phone towers. So in many ways, Israel comes to resemble, or not just comes to resemble, but is, in certain ways, a late 19th century model of a settler colonial state, where enclosure shows no signs of abating. So the West Bank and Gaza are divided and fragmented into these isolated enclaves, and inside each of these enclaves, most Palestinians are poor and working class. Their lives are marked by poverty, by dispossession, and by constant repression. The fragmentation and the containment of Palestinians takes place through these many visible and architectural aspects of enclosure. Maps, walls, checkpoints, turnstiles, fences, barbed wires, control towers, uh, bypass roads and highways, which are all then also compounded by control of movement, by permit systems and ID cards and much more. So suffice it to say that there's this kind of diffuse network across Palestinian spaces, which entrenches a sort of multi-layered enclosure program of territorial annexation, of economic degradation, of political disempowerment, and of social fragmentation. The role of the military and the security regime here is paramount. So Palestinian areas, and especially Gaza, have become zones of experimentation and control in which military technologies, policing, and security models and ideas are tried out and produced, so that the oppression of Palestinians is an intentional outcome as a source of profit. Is Israel relies on the confinement and the repression of Palestinians in sustaining its export-led economy. So at the political level, the Israeli state remains in control of the core military and political aspects, but at the same time, it contracts out and privatizes uh, the different kinds of services that end up controlling Palestinians. Um, at the economic level, this private securitization reaps tremendous profits. So in other words, the management of the conflict is one that stresses these technological solutions. Alongside the military and various security apparatuses, Israel also has a complex bureaucracy that perpetuates a surveillance enclosure. Gathering of information through both new and, uh, like, through low and high-tech means, if you want, through informers, using information as blackmail, through military and police raids, arrests, quotidian uh, monitoring, even monitoring of animal movements and animal produce, control over exports and imports and cash flow, the list goes on. So surveillance is inscribed at the level of, that is in, inscribed at the level of Palestinian society is not just a tool for resolving a security dilemma, but it is a technique of social control, of political domination, and of economic profit. Israel-Palestine is equally where digital enclosure kind of rears its ugly head. Internet and digital activity is extensively monitored and surveyed for Palestinians. Infrastructure is under full Israeli control. Every landline telephone call, for example, is physically wired through Israel. Cellular phone signals are under Israel's control. Palestinian internet providers' bandwidth and connection is also determined by Israel. And Palestinians are sold very little of it. So in terms of access, of infrastructure, and of space, it's not simply that these things have become private, but they're also limited, controlled, surveyed, and in the case of Palestinians, also cost a lot. So simultaneously, this condition of what I've elsewhere called digital occupation is formidably profitable for Israel. So it's no surprise to hear that Israeli firms are at the forefront of cybersecurity, of spyware, of digital censorship, of border, you know, border security control, cell phone tracking, and so much more. So a few examples, um, just to sort of uh, put, put this into context. Um, the Israeli uh, cyber, spy, cyber spy manufacturer NSO is among the largest high-tech companies operating in the, sort of, in the world of espionage and state spying. Pegasus software, or spyware, is designed to penetrate mobile phones, and it's sold to countries ranging from Mexico to Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, but also European countries who then use Pegasus 
to, uh, to sort of ascertain whether or not asylum seekers really did originate from Afghanistan or Eritrea or Syria by sort of tapping into their cell phone data. Israeli firm Black Cube worked for Harvey Weinstein to dig up information on his Hollywood accusers. Uh, the security firm G4S is a sort of well entrenched, is, is well entrenched in the US profit driven mass incarceration system. The thousands of video cameras that are installed throughout the New York City subway system and the ability to automatically sift through all of this video uh, data. Uh, are those by the Israeli firm Visual Defense. A de another firm called Suspect Detec Detection System uh, is a firm that uses biometric information such as how, a per how much a person sweats and how uh, to determine a level of threat. You can spot, for example, the scanner of the anti-theft Israeli company Checkpoint in just about every shop or mall in the United States, a technology which shouldn't come as a surprise was really kind of emerged uh, at checkpoints in the West Bank. AnyVision, another Israeli biometric company, specializes in AI or artificial intelligence, as well as face, body, and object recognition, and, uh, and consistently sort of monitors checkpoints in the West Bank, and then cross-checks Palestinians by linking not just what happens at the checkpoints, but also various cameras that are installed throughout the Palestinian territories, and then accessing these different captured images. So Israeli firms are at the forefront of the convergence between, you know, predictive policing and computer algorithms, right? So algorithms are themselves then trained to learn, to codify, to manipulate and make visible Palestinian behavior, as well as the tendencies, uh, as well as, as people's tendencies, with the aim of sort of transforming these into strategies of control. Um, all of this, you know, um, Israeli firms mine social media data. That shouldn't sort of come as a surprise either. And then this kind of data is then stored and in many cases used to extort or blackmail a person. The Palestinian Authority now also uses predictive policing uh, for arresting Palestinian dissenters by evaluating the contents of social media participation and posts, even on people who don't have any, uh, who haven't committed any violent acts or haven't even engaged in protest activities. So the examples are plenty, and while I think all of the ones that I've pointed out are kind of largely malicious, uh, the point here is really to recognize the connection between territorial, economic, and digital enclosure of Palestinians, the commodification of the data that they create, and very often unwillingly, sometimes even unknowingly, the lack of transparency and public oversight, and then the profit that these enable to Israeli and other firms and governments. And the point, or not the point, but part of it is also to recognize that it doesn't matter to what ends. Yes, sometimes it could be about threatening democratic norms or strengthening, strengthening the grips of dictators or, or uh, sort of colonial or authoritarian rules, but it's also about monitoring the workforce or your competitors or citizens or just enriching corporate officers and stockholders. Um, so Israel's use of all of these technologies and tactics have to be understood in this broader context of exerting control through systems that result from the dynamics of enclosure. So enclosure refers to, these le to legal and symbolic power, to a form of social alienation, to a mode of existence where economic precarity is actually exacerbated. It's a means by which we can understand capitalist spaces. It's also, uh, it's also these spaces, if you want, where people's political organization or socioeconomic freedom is undermined, where people face restrictions on physical mobility, on freedom of expression, where the circulation of political thought is constrained. Um, it also gestures towards this regime of imprisonment, of warfare and state violence, of the intertwining of technological controls and geopolitics. So while this is critically important to understand the Palestinian predicament, it's also becoming a landscape that is possible and increasingly not just possible, but actually in existence everywhere. Israel is a high-tech settler colony located at the front lines of this global war on terror. But Israel is just a node, if you want, in the larger network. The designs and the techniques emerge in one site, proliferate in another. Coordination, cooperation, trade, sales take place globally with little regard to public good, 
to equality or justice or democratic ideals or ethics beyond the bottom line. So enclosure is the overlapping of colonialism, of capitalism, and of surveillance technologies. In the case of Israel-Palestine, it signals ominously for any future peace between them. But I think it's also a lot more pernicious than that because it's, it's increasingly the digital and the real world in which we all live, no matter where we are.